This month's podcast is quite a special one, as I have only just returned to the UK from a research stay in Nidar Oberstein, and my guest is in fact someone who has built his life there now, and I really wanted to catch up with him in the valley, but did not have the chance to meet during the short time I was there. So, for an overdue conversation to discuss his career and the reasons he chose to relocate from London to Germany, I will be speaking to Paul Morris. Paul is a British Academy of Jewelry graduate, trained as a jeweler at the Academy before he decided to relocate and expand his horizons. With much excitement, I would like to say welcome, Paul. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Paul, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you currently do? Oh, um, well, I'm now in my early 30s, which is crazy to think because I started British Academy of Jewelry when I was 24. And um, then, yeah, so now I'm living in Oberstein, Germany, and I am a goldsmith at a stone carving company. So you are a graduate of the Academy, but you moved to Idar, Oberstein, in Germany. Could you tell us a little bit more about why you decided to move to Germany? Well, um, I was in my last my last year at the British Academy of Jewellery, and you started this um, this wonderful project, uh, Ring is the Ring is the Ring, and the collaboration with the Ed Oberstein School and the school in Florence was uh, really eye opening. And when I saw the school here in Germany, and to um, to expand my horizons and go into stone cutting was uh well just learn to work with stone should i say was very interesting and appealing to me and as i knew i was in my last year and coming towards the end of the studies i thought why not apply and see what happens and also by chance i happened to find someone here as well and i thought well you know why not see what happens with both you know and Ida Oberstein is a very particular place for people who don't know it or haven't been there. Could you tell me a little bit about what your sort of experience is of this city? Uh, it's very particular indeed, that's, that's for sure. It, it is a very like small, quaint town. It's very quiet. Not a lot goes on, but at the same time, it's got a really wonderful, rich history in the stone cutting and stone carving trade. And it's just, it's insane to see, like even now living here for over three years to just see barrels of rough stones and like even, it's it's just insane because almost stone here is the currency in some respects. It's, um, you just see it everywhere. And I've never been to a place in the world where when a brick is broken in the street, they replace it with a stone. You know, I've seen agates and rose quartz concreted into the ground to hide holes, which is just insane. It's just, it blows my mind. It's uh, it's a very beautiful city in a sense of its history and everything. Yeah, it's quite remarkable, isn't it? Having just been there, I can attest that it's pretty much on every corner or every other house, there is something <laughs> happening with stone, isn't it? Yeah. And I would say even as well that you have lots of experts in the in this medium there as well. For sure. Like if you could talk to these people, it is a fountain of history and knowledge and just I can't even comprehend what kind of like teachings and learnings are here and history of what people have gone through and everything, because some of the buildings that you see today they used to be diamond dealers but now they're stone cutters and how they transformed and moved and and also with the modern technology as well coming in to the industry that's very that's very interesting as well so that yeah it's something really just mind-blowing you are of course now working in the industry in Idar Oberstein could you tell us a little bit about your sort of current role the company you work for I work for the, uh, the, uh, the company, Pauli, the Art of Carving. Currently, I am their goldsmith. It's a very fun, interesting place to work at. You know, there's a whole level of creativity 
and the level of craftsmanship in one building, about two technically, because there is the other company as well, but the building I'm in, the level of craftsmanship is insane. We have employees that can just take a 2D image of an animal and within, you know, depend on the size of the piece that they carve, you can have a full 3D carving within four hours or a couple of days, you know, and it is anatomically perfect. It just blows my mind. It's a whole different world. And I'm very fortunate, fortunate enough to um, be the goldsmiths. So when a client would request any gold work for a, um, for a piece they've ordered, if they need just, even if it's ideas, how to set this piece, or if they want the full shebang, so we say like beginning to end, everything done, I get to help out in that process, which is wonderful. There's quite a, a diverse range of people working there. How does it feel to be one component of this really multifunctional team? Oh, it's fantastic, you know, because everyone brings something different to the table. And on top of that, we have so many different nationalities there. So it's a very kind of international company. And from that, you can learn so much from how they got taught with their skills and back in their home country and their culture and how they how they approach things. So it's, it's fascinating. It's a world of knowledge. And so you are, I would say, a young craftsman. Is it challenging to get started in this industry? Could you maybe share how you got the job and what they were looking for when they appointed you? I'll be honest. I think I feel that I got lucky myself, you know. But in general, for this industry, yes, it is difficult. Like with going into anything, especially if you want to be self-employed, it's very much hard to start any business from the ground up, whatever profession. But um, in the jewellery, gem carving, gem cutting industry, it is, it is very saturated, of course. But if you can get your foot in the door with the right companies and you can get yourself a uh, an apprenticeship then it is it makes things a bit easier for sure you know as far as when i applied for the company they were really 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 busy and in need of staff so uh, it was just by chance that someone at the school because they knew i was looking for work said hey why not try them and i uh, yeah sure okay so i um i i went there I gave him my CV and kind of apologized that because I can't speak any German. You know? So, um, but luckily it's a very international company as well. They do travel a lot. They go to Tucson. So their English is perfectly fine. And um, yeah, they interviewed me. We spoke. I had a trial week um, that was very intense because uh, normally it's just five days and I hadn't done any stone carving before, you know. My closest thing to carving is just wax carving for jewellery, which is somewhat similar. And um, yeah, I'm using the tools for the first time that I've never been taught. So um, in the end, I had a seven day trial week. That worked out really, really well. They were super happy. And then I started in the March and kind of with the intent of doing my apprenticeship with them. That wasn't until September. So for those six months I was just kind of given kind of like learning work so to speak nothing for the company but just practice and get me comfortable with the tools and get me started and learn the equipment which was very 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 good and um, yeah then towards the end of my I guess my six month wait for the apprenticeship I got started on a big project for an artist I can't say who because I'm actually contractually obliged to not say I've signed an NDA, so I can't say, but it was a big, heavy statue. It's one meter 20 high and it weighs about 500 kilos. And um, all the pre carving had been done. So it was just kind of here's the model and add the final details and then later do the polishing. So I got worked on that and they were really happy with my work. But then they took me off because my apprenticeship started. And that project finished. But then six months later, the project got reinitiated. The artist wanted it again. And so I got pulled off my apprenticeship for that. And 
then until February last year, for one year, I was working directly doing the carving with another employee, a friend of mine, and um, in between an occasional third person on there. And yeah, that's pretty much caught up to the start of Corona, I guess. And uh, then I got taken off the project and got put on Quartzarbeit, which is just short time work. For, I, I just stayed at home for most of the summer. And, um, but I could still help out the company doing little bits on social media, which was a, a nice change and kept me busy, kept me active. So, um, and then towards the beginning of last September, then I came back full time and was starting my goldsmith work. So yeah, it's been a crazy journey so far. Yeah, that sounds really incredible, like learning on the job. Because working mm. in stone is a very different approach than working in metal. In metal, we, I mean, I often build up rather than take material away, uh, additive rather than subtractive. So do you experience this difference and or other differences? Oh, for sure. Like when I first started stone carving, it was a whole different way of thinking because like you, and I think even as a kid, when I was playing with Legos, I always built things up, you know? So jewelry is the same thing. Here's a flat sheet. Let's turn it up into a ring. Let's add all the components. But then to say, okay, the object is inside it. Now you've got to remove, remove something. Yeah, it's uh, like I mentioned earlier, the closest I can relate it to is, is wax carving and jewelry. You know, you have exactly the same thing. The only downside to stone carving is that if you remove too much, you can't add it back like you can wax. It is, you're done, you've got to start from the beginning. And unfortunately, also because stone is an organic material, it is natural, it can chip, it can break, and you have to roll with the punches sometimes you could be finishing a piece polishing it gets a bit too warm and then it breaks and that's all your hours lost you know you can't do anything about it has that happened to you yes yes it has yeah it's part of the process you have to definitely you know you have to understand the stone and of course the more experienced you get the less it happens but sometimes there are inclusions that you can't see that you just touch the stone the wrong way and it happens, you know? It's unavoidable. It's scary. Yeah, it is. But I think there's also the fun about it as well because once you finish this piece and it turns out how you want it and you've had no problems, then it's a great achievement. Because with metal, you know, we all acknowledge that each metal, gold compared to silver, has its sort of behaviors. But with stone, is this mm -hmm. magnified even more because of these inclusions and because it is different? Or is, it compa is that comparable? Like you mentioned, you know, gold and silver, platinum are very different. Silver is much softer than gold. And platinum can be very hard to work with, you know, not just in forming, but also when coming to polishing. Just like with silver, super easy. And, and it's exactly the same with stone. Because if you're carving quartz or like rock crystal or rose quartz anything like that it is kind of what I call for myself the middle stone it's not too hard it's not too soft it's quite nice to work with though because it is so abundant it's also sometimes there is the low quality grade so you do have the inclusions and some of these will definitely fight against you whereas jade is probably one of my favorite ones to carve because because of the crystal structure in the stone, you can do anything you want to it. And it's not that much harder than quartz on the most scale. But when it comes to carving, it is much, much, much more resilient. It does not like to get carved. You really have to, you know, put a whole different pressure on the tools. And from that, you can destroy your tools much quicker than you would something else. And then, you know, then there are stones like lapis, which are much softer and they've got quartz and pyrite in them. And these little differences in the stone can also cause issues when carving because you might be hitting a quartz layer, which is relatively hard, but if you then hit the pyrite layer, it is super soft and it's like powder. So the pressure can change instantly 
and like how much cutting the tool does in a split second and sometimes you can't see that you can't know that it's just it's it's very blind that's the huge that's the biggest difference from stone to metal for sure this is quite a big learning curve also right paul because did you have to sort of catch up on some gemology and sort of because there are so many different stones and so many different properties of each stone and then each stone can be different from one to the other how do you start if you have this new material in front of you well that's it like you said you know every stone has its own properties its own crystal structure and it is it is very much a learning curve sometimes what they got me to do was okay here's an agate and here's an obsidian agate is a very hard material and it is again wonderful to carve obsidian natural glass is very soft so what they'd get me to do is work on both simultaneously okay make this cut make this cut make this form and you very quickly see that the obsidian material has gone much faster than the agate so then you kind of very kind of visually see that okay these are huge differences that's how i kind of learned was kind of given these different extremities when carving just so i could get used to hey not all stones are the same you have to treat them differently and it it is just putting it into practice and also understanding the softer the stone the less aggressive the tool has to be because if you're to use the same one on an agate or even a sapphire then that is going to be powder in seconds so yeah the equipment to work with stone is also a little bit different how do you sort of is it is it all about feeling and then choosing the right tools or are there some pieces of equipment that you've learned to use that help you with this and is there any equipment that you are really interested in with stone that we might not have seen with metal here in germany they have a very traditional stone carving tool which is called a spindle which the best way i can describe it is like a lathe but instead of the lathe holding the piece and you use the tool to remove material the lathe holds the tool and you are holding the piece and you are then moving the stone around the tool to carve this was what i started my trial week on and it was completely mind blowing to me how it works and there's various tools different shapes different sizes and you know i guess you could call it like sandpaper yeah there's different aggressiveness of uh, the diamond wheels so you've got really 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 fine grade and you've got really aggressive so it's just kind of like learning all of these and having the availability of all these sizes all these shapes and all these like aggressiveness in the tools is uh, yeah it's it's definitely a whole new world and but they also do use your micro motor or pendant motor with diamond tools so it's also very similar because if you're working on a 500 kilo statue you can't hold that and carve that under a spindle it's not possible so we do use the hand tools for large pieces and sometimes they're just more flexible than a spindle so you can really kind of change your angle and get into the really hard to reach places but then some people in the company i work for they've been carving stone for over 30 years and they much prefer the spindle. They can do everything and more than with a hand tool, which also just blows my mind. That's just experience and knowledge and really knowing the stone and the tools and the machine. For most of these tools, you use water, yes? So this is also different than metal, where you, we often use fire rather than water to work. Do you enjoy working with the water more than with the fire or are you both, do you think both of them are interesting too? I like both. I like the process of, I say like love the process of jewelry and being able to control and manipulate with fire and everything. But at the same time with water, it's kind of, I know it's constantly refreshing, so to speak. I mean, it is, it is much more messy because you do get sprayed in the body and the face constantly, you know. It is very much wet work. You can't carve and be dry by the end of it, that's for sure. 
when we're soldering and the metal starts to glow, it gets much harder to see things. But it's also the same as when working with stone. When it's wet, it looks like it's completely polished and clean and you can't exactly see everything. If you're trying to carve a little bit away, sometimes you're completely blind. So you have to go a lot by feel, which is, um, is somewhat as you would with soldering in some respects. You have to kind of really kind of look past everything and understand when the solder's flown. For anyone thinking about wanting to work with stone, what would you recommend they do? Where should they go? What, what should they read? How can they get started? That is a very good question. I would, of course, I would say, get yourself an apprenticeship because that way you learn everything. To do it on your own is much harder. Yes, you can buy some diamond tools, but at the same time, you're going in blind. But it's possible, of course. Is also, I would definitely recommend learn about gemstones because that's very important. You have to understand the stones. You have to know their hardnesses, their, their crystal structures, because even with stone carving and stone cutting, they're two different, completely different professions. And they require the same knowledge, but also different understanding. For, for example, topaz to carve can be quite nice, but topaz to facet, if you're on the wrong cleavage plane, you can knock the top of the stone really easily. And topaz, from what I understand, does not like to get polished at certain angles. Whereas if you're carving it, you're a bit more free. There's little things like this, which you can only really learn in my opinion, by asking lots of questions and being part of the journey from the, from the apprenticeship and working your way up and learning the knowledge and learning everything step by step. For those who don't know the difference between carving and faceting, what's faceting? Faceting is it's the same similar process, but carving normally consists of copying nature, so to speak. If you want to represent a leaf in gemstone, you can look at a leaf and you can carve it. Pastin is adding geometrical proportions to a stone to normally either have a, a nice carrot weight or to have like a brilliant cut for perfect reflection. Facets are what you tend to see in your normal day-to-day -day jewelry, diamonds, sapphires, emeralds, they're all, in the, they're all in the high streets, you know. That is a stone which has been faceted and that is a very, again, a very interesting and very technical profession, for sure. Especially if you're here in Ida Oberstein that love to do the traditional method without using the modern technology machines. It is, you know, you need to have a very good hand and a very, you know, even better eyes. Carving is more organic and faceting perhaps is a little bit more geometric, a little bit more mathematical in its sense. With, with carving, you have the freedom to kind of make organic shapes and do what you want. Whereas faceting, it's in the name. You create facets which are geometrical cuts on a stone. Yeah, it's very much mathematical and it's very very precise to get a brilliant cut stone you have to understand again like it's light reflectivity it's, it's light index and everything because a diamond will have different proportions to a sapphire and that will have different different proportions to a tanzanite it's maybe micro differences but it makes all the difference it makes all the difference Interesting. So you mentioned an apprenticeship. The educational system in Germany is a little bit different than the one in London. You started what's yes. called a gazella. Could you tell us more about this and whether you are planning to continue it at some point or you're not so sure because it's working slash gazella might be challenging? It's basically an apprenticeship. It's a, a gazelle proofing is a test during the apprenticeship, but the gazelle is just a type of learning so it's equivalent to the English apprenticeship in some respects you go to school twice a week normally and then the other times you're at the company learning the system the educational system they do like to throw other things in 
so they yeah i had to learn the german language but it's it's not literature it's just the language so for me that's insanely difficult someone who doesn't really speak german at the time and had been in the country for less than a year and struggles with the language to get thrown in this was just insane and then all the classes as well everything's in german in in the school i was fortunate enough that they talked to me english at work but when i'm there do religious studies and math and gemology to learn gemology in a language you don't understand is a challenge and and a half to say the least but i did come out in the gemology it did come out of a couple of good grades in the time i was doing it the german language i was doing terrible on i'm not going to lie but i mean that's just due to language barrier you know if i was to go back there again and with my slightly better german i speak now then um, i might do a bit better but i still have a lot to learn german language one is that's for sure now as far as continuing the gazella i would definitely consider it right now i am very happy where i am being the goldsmith in the company and still have an access to talk to all the individuals and pick up and learn things and watch them work because i find that is a very easy way for me to learn is kind of watch how someone does it i know people can learn by watching by reading or by listening you know we all learn in different ways but for me i'm very much a visual learner so if i see someone do it i understand what they're doing but then i just need a lot of practice to get to their level of course so um, yeah it would be nice but at the same time right now at this point i'm happy where things are you of course made your own work at the academy do you still have time to make your own work as well yes and no i i try to but at the same time sometimes work can be quite demanding like of any day-to-day job so in the evening the last thing you want to, the last thing you want to do is try and you know do something for yourself and just so exhausted but i do i try and make some pieces from now and then the first oh, just over 18 months i was here i lived in a very very small apartment so i had no space for a workbench or anything so i couldn't do anything at all and then when i moved into the new flat we set up a little goldsmithing stone cutting area or stone carving area so um yeah since then i've done a few pieces i made a genius engagement ring um i also made a couple of a friend back home there engagement ring and wedding rings as so i am doing some pieces but you know not really for my own business and whatever at the moment which is a shame but at the same time when i have time i'll have time you know i'm happy with how it is at the moment yeah so congratulations by the way on getting engaged and hopefully soon getting married so my last question is this kind of gave it away is there anything that we can look forward to in the near future or are you thinking of maybe making some work for a for an exhibition or are you is your company doing anything exciting that we should be looking out for anything that you can share for my for myself i do have um, one project that i trying to get started it's been it's been a long time in the process i bought everything i needed and then it was just okay i have i have the stone i have my model but now i don't have the stone carving equipment so um, it's literally probably been the last 6 months that i've finally been able to build some kind of stone related workshop because uh, it's expensive to work in stone is expensive and to and to invest in any machines and tools it's not easy yeah so i've got a little project there i can't give away any details it's in the making and uh, i hope if, in an ideal world i would definitely like to get it so i can give it to the company and they can take it just to tucson next year but it's a lot of hours worth of work so i've really got to um i've really got to commit myself and say no to sitting down at the computer at the end of the day and or get in stuck on my phone scrolling and uh, as far as the, what the company's doing is my 
boss is currently in Dubai at an exhibition and they've got in a couple of weeks a they're taking part in an exhibition in Switzerland I believe now corona is kind of lifting now like next year I think is when the stone the stone shows are going to be happening again so the big one of course is Tucson we're normally there every year so that's uh, I'd like to go there one day myself because it's from what I've heard, it's just incredible. A whole week, a whole city turns into basically, you know, a big part of Arizona just turns into one big gem show. In America, correct? Yeah, it's in Arizona. I think every year, sometime, I think it's the end of January, early February normally. Anyone who loves stones, I recommend that. They have everything. Carvings, fasted stones, rough stones. No, stones as far as the eyes can see. Graduates from the British Academy of Jewelry find their way in a range of careers. Some stay in London, others move abroad. What is really fantastic to hear is that Paul decided to expand his skill set and move to a very interesting city for love and to learn and work. Idar Oberstein is often called the gemstone capital of Europe and everyone considering to work with stone it's certainly recommended to stop there and have a look, but be aware you might never want to come back. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for joining us today to shed a light on your life in Idar Oberstein and your practice. We certainly look forward to seeing what you do next. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a great pleasure and it's been fantastic to catch up. Next month, I will be joined by another guest. So watch this space to find out who it is. But for now, this was Sophie Boons for the BAJ podcast with Paul Morris. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.